Hi, this is Colin Mitchell with Monster Technology. Thanks for joining us for the data webinar. We're just waiting a few more minutes for a couple more of our attendees to join. All right, and we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks for joining us for the Datto hosted webinar to learn how to protect your data from ransomware. My name is Colin Mitchell, and I'm the CEO and founder of Monster Technology. Monster Technology is a nationwide managed service provider specializing in IT services um, and disaster recovery. And we actually today are having an attendee giveaway. Um, so everybody who joins us today will be entered in to win a $100 Amazon gift card. Thanks again for joining us. And we will be sending the recording um, as well as announcing the winner of the giveaway um, by the end of business today. And we have Michael De Palma who's channel development manager at Datto, who will be taking over the webinar. All right, thank you, Colin. So my name is Mike De Palma, uh, channel development manager here at Datto. Um, so we're going to be getting into kind of rethinking backup in general today. And we're getting into some of the uh, threats that we're seeing out there. Um, so to kind of kick things off, let me uh, you know, just to, just when I mean rethink backup, it's pretty simple, right? I mean, for years, backup has been bought and sold as an insurance policy, right? You need a second copy of your data just in case your building burns down, right? Or there's some sort of flood or a fire or a tornado or one of these natural disasters. Now, we protect at Datto about 250 petabytes of data, which is a massive amount of data. For those of you not familiar with how large a petabyte is, if you, most people know the size of an MP3 file. If you have one petabyte of MP3 files, you could play music continuously for 2,000 years. We protect 250 of those, so massive amount of data. And with that, we, we do a lot of studies about what the cause of downtime and what the cause of data loss is. And whereas most people think they need a second copy of their data for one of these natural disasters that I just showed you, the truth is 93% of all data loss and, and downtime have nothing to do with those types of, of natural disasters. The leading cause of downtime I think if we give it some thought, we'll all get to that same conclusion, is actually user error, right? It's somebody in the office clicking on the wrong attachment, going to the wrong hyperlink, going to the wrong website, and infecting your network. And these aren't malicious acts by, you know, uh, nefarious people in your office. They're typically just somebody not knowing what they're supposed to click on, not knowing what to look for, and, and inadvertently infecting their network. And that's what we see. So obviously, people are your greatest weakness. It's not uh, protecting yourself against these natural disasters or those type of things. Um, so that's kind of where we want to start with, right? I mean, no matter where you're getting your news from, whether it's a, 
you know, online, which most people do, or traditional newspaper, you know, you're going to be bombarded with cybersecurity attack stories. It's almost hard to sift through which ones kind of apply to you. Now, this one's actually a couple years old. This is a uh, about a company, Alcoa, a manufacturing company out of Pennsylvania, billion dollar company. An email went out to just 15 of their employees. They got one person to click on it, and they were able to infiltrate their network. And that's what we're seeing. And the reason I keep this particular article in here from the Wall Street Journal is for this quote, which is hanging up on our office back here in Norwalk, Connecticut, and that is at least one employee will click on anything. And that goes for any company you're in. I mean, I, we're in the world of disaster recovery here in business continuity. We still get the emails that go out to all at datto.com from our ops team notifying us that there's a suspicious email going around. And if you do get it, please don't click on anything and notify us. And, and how did they get notified of it? Well, chances are somebody in some department clicked on that email, and, and that's what happened, and we were able to detect it. But really no profession is safe from these type of attackers, right? And they're, what they're relying upon is that somebody in your office isn't going to know what to look for, and they're going to get they're going to get into your system. So, you know, the days of the uh, emails you'd get from your long-lost uncle, apparently, saying, hey, send me $5,000, I'm going to send you a million dollars, those days are over. Um, what we're seeing now is these criminals are using socially engineered spear phishing attacks to make it look like every other email in your inbox. That's their goal. So it's going to look like maybe it came from uh, your boss or from another coworker or from a, a third party vendor. Maybe we've seen a lot of them that look just like every other email you might get from Netflix. Click on this hyperlink to reset your password. Except if you were to scroll over that hyperlink, you'd notice it's not sending you back to Netflix. It's sending to some squirrely website that's going to infect your network. We see it with FedEx all the time. Please click here to, to track the status of your, your shipment. You click on that, and again, it's not sending you back to FedEx. It's going to send you to a site that's going to infect your network. Um, we, we really, they're, they're very creative, and again, the goal is they're going to gather as much information as they can about you so that they know that this email is going to look like 99% of the emails out there. Now, where all of this, uh, all these criminals are kind of heading and where we're seeing the biggest spike in criminal activity, uh, especially in these type of security stories, is, is ransomware, right? It's a big thing. Now, it's hard to exactly pinpoint exactly what the cost to, to small and mid-sized businesses is, okay? Because back in 2015, the FBI estimated that about $325 million was specifically netted by these criminals in payments from small businesses directly to the criminals. Last year, you know, they're kind of still putting the numbers together. It's anywhere between a half a billion and a billion dollars. And that's an exact, that's just in payments. When the FBI started looking into what the cost of this was to small businesses, the actual cost to them, not just in the money they had to pay out, they were looking at a number somewhere in the neighborhood of $50 billion. Now, what's the difference? What's the discrepancy there? Well, that is now including what the downtime cost these businesses. All right, because even if you're paying that ransom, you might not get your data back right away. You might not get it back at all. And if you're trying to recover and it takes you two to three days, what is the cost to your business? Now, remember, that's what the criminals are relying upon. They're relying upon the fact that you could start doing the math in your head and say, hey, I could pay this $2,500 ransom, or it could be down for two days by I recover my data. What's going to cost me more? A lot of times that ransom is going to be priced at a place that's less than what the cost of downtime would be. So when you start to try to pinpoint exactly what the cost is, the numbers are staggering, and they're in the tens of billions of dollars, and that's really what we're looking at. Um, so obviously this ransomware is, is widespread. So let's start and pull it back a little bit and go, well, what is ransomware? Because there's a lot of misconceptions out there about what exactly it does. Now, ransomware, the, the data is not actually leaving your system, okay? There's a lot of people that think they're actually stealing your data. And for years, that's what these criminals were doing. They were trying to find businesses who, on, who had data that on its own was valuable, right? You had personal information, you had credit information, you had financial information, health information, and they knew that if they could actually steal that data, they can go and sell it on the open market and make some money. What ransomware does is it's actually, the genius behind it is they can cast a much wider net because they really don't care what that data is. All they're doing is encrypting it and saying, I'm gonna, I know that it's very important to you, and I'll give you that encryption key if you pay me some money to get it back. So that means everybody is susceptible, down to a one-man shop, uh, all the way up to the large businesses, to municipalities. We've seen police departments attacked. We've seen universities attacked. It really makes that net so widespread that they could really attack anybody because they don't even need to know what your data is. They just know that in today's world, you are very tied to your data, and if you can't get access to it, your business will be shut down. Now, they demand their money in Bitcoin because it's very hard to track, right? The problem with that is 
depending on where you are and where you're listening from, it might not be too easy to get Bitcoin. I mean, I'm up here in the Northeast. We're about 40 miles east of Manhattan. It's pretty easy to find a Bitcoin exchange. Uh, I was doing a, a seminar out in uh, Manhattan, Kansas, and we had a woman who rose their hand, and she had been hit with ransomware, and they had no recourse. They had to pay to get their, their data back, and it took her four days to find an exchange. So not only did they have to pay the ransom, it took her four days. She was down for four days. Uh, as a side note, that woman was actually the woman who was at the attended the seminar was an HR manager, and she was actually the one who got duped into clicking on the wrong email. And she says, you know, look, I get emails from from uh, potential uh, employers all day long, and I get these emails back and forth, and it looked like every other email in my inbox. Just to kind of reiterate that, but that's what we're seeing. So in in Q4 of last year, we did the largest ransomware specific uh, survey of its kind, 1,100 partners responded. So managed service providers like Monster Technology responded across North America. 91% had at least one client who was attacked by ransomware in the last 12 months. 43% had six or more attacks in the last year. And 31% had multiple ransomware attacks, ransomware attacks in the same day. Now I did a, uh, a seminar out in Chicago to a group of law firms. And specifically, this one was specifically about ransomware. So I started out the conversation with raise your hand if you've been hit with ransomware. Now, obviously, a couple hands went up. I went on and completed my, my presentation. And afterwards, I'm sitting down having lunch and sitting next to the gentleman who raised their hand. And I said, so I saw you raise your hand. You guys got hit with ransomware. And the guy said, yeah, you know, we were hit three times in the span of six months. I said, wow. I said, did you ever figure out how they were getting in? Uh, do you know, is it coming through like the HR manager example I gave or was it Netflix or do you know who inside was actually falling for the emails? And the guy kind of shrugged his shoulders and he said, uh, yeah, it was actually me. Uh, I'm the one who clicked on uh, the wrong email all three times. So I'm actually here at this seminar as punishment. And I said, look, don't feel too bad about yourself. You must be a really good lawyer if you've infected your network three times in the last six months and you're still there. But that just shows you. And people think, okay, I've paid that ransom. It'll never happen to me again. That's not the case. Uh, that you, if you're not cleaning that up in the background, that ransomware is still running in the background, and you have the ability to pop up at any time. Um, one of the reasons why it's so hard to pinpoint that number, and I talked about it gets anywhere between a half a billion and a billion dollars, and what the actual cost to the, the businesses were, it's kind of hard to pinpoint. But we found that less than one in four ransomware incidents are reported to authorities. And the reason for that is, you know, you might see the stories in the paper about uh, the hospitals and the uh, you know the big large universities that are attacked and those make the those make the uh, papers but the vast majority of these folks are small businesses that are being attacked and on average the average ransomware payment is somewhere around twenty five hundred dollars so you wonder how so many people are paying it well it's because like I said you start doing that math in your head and being down for several days is going to cost you more than that twenty five hundred dollars but when you think about it on a broader scale think about it even if it is only five hundred million dollars was netted think about $500 million broken up into small $2,500 increments. Think of how many people were not only attacked, but had no other recourse but to pay that ransom. It's a staggering number. And the reason why only one in four incidents are reported to authorities is because, again, it's usually not big enough for the FBI to get involved. They're not going to get involved if they hear about an $1,800 ransomware from a small business. The local authorities, these things are going to take a lot longer than, than actually just paying the ransom and getting back up and running. Um, so, you know, there's staggering numbers. So 42% of that report did pay the ransom because they didn't have any way to get their data back. And one in four of those never recovered the data. Okay. So only 75% actually they, that, that paid actually got their data back. Because again, you're not dealing with honest folks here. These are criminals. So you might say, here's my $2,500 payment. And you might get an email back that says, thank you so much for your down payment. Now here, click here to pay the remain, remaining balance of $2,500. Or Thank you so much for your payment of $2,500. Now you could pay this account $100 every month on a reoccurring basis and we'll never attack you again. There's actually a new strain of ransomware out there called popcorn ransomware. And what they're doing is saying, yes, you could pay me $2,500 and I'll give you your data or you can go out and infect two people for me. These are not honest folks out there. These are people that are just trying to get as much money as quickly as they can from people. And if you want to help them out by infecting some other competitors or whatever you're doing, that's what they're looking for. So that's why the FBI is, is urging everyone, do not pay that ransom. A, you might not get your, your data back, but B, you're encouraging these people to continue what they're doing, which is just, uh, you know, like I said, running completely rampant right now. Um, you know, I mentioned some of the larger news stories last year out in Hollywood. There was that hospital that was hit. And, you know, not only did they have to pay their $17,000 in Bitcoin, they actually had some servers that were down for up to two weeks. 
Think about what that does to the bottom line of the hospital. And again, think about what that does to the reputation of that hospital. And again, when the FBI finished their investigation, they found there's probably just a simple case of a member of the staff clicking on a malicious link or an attachment in an email. That's how these criminals are getting through. They're relying on somebody to look at that email and say, hey, this looks like every other email in my inbox. Let me click on this. I'm busy with a million things. And that's how they get in. Um, I mentioned that the Department of Homeland Security, they, they, they put out their first alert on ransomware specifically on July 11th of last year. And they went through some of the different variants. And if you're curious, there's about 4 million variants out there right now. Because I get the question all the time, what's the government doing? Well, what can they really do to combat 4 million variants? They could put a lot of resources in to try to shut one down. And all that'll mean is, hey, we've got 3,999,000 left out there. How can they do that? So they went through some of the variants. And then they came up with recommendations. And reading through it, you would assume their first recommendation would be on the prevention side, right? You need X or Y in place in order to prevent it. But in fact, their number one recommendation was to employ a data backup recovery plan for all your critical information. I was up in Rochester in January, and I did a panel with a gentleman from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. And what he said was essentially you have two options. You can either pay the ransom when you're hit. I mean, if everything gets through and you're hit with ransomware, you pay the ransom, which the government highly uh, recommends you do not do, or you restore from the backup. So it comes down to the speed of how you can do that. But those are your two options, or you just shut down. And they're seeing, obviously, the uptick, and they're expecting that number to skyrocket even further this year as incidents continue to rise. So that's coming right from the Department of Homeland Security, right? The employer data backup a recovery plan, because it's really the only true way that you know you're going to get your data back. So you might say, all right, well, I do have a backup solution already in place. That's great, all right? I, I know that if I get hit, I can go restore from my data. I could give you a, a real-life example that occurred just this blast. Black Friday out in California, okay, out in uh, San Francisco. The San Francisco Metro Transit Authority was hit with ransomware on Black Friday. You've got to give it to these criminals. They are smart. So they hit you right when you, you're, you least expect it and when you're most vulnerable. So by policy, they said, well, we're not going to pay a ransom. That's not what we're going to do. Uh, we're not going to pay the $73,000, all right, but uh, we have a backup. So they went to their tech team and said, how long, can we, how long until we're back up and running? They said, we could have you back up and running by Sunday. So now they're faced with a decision. It's really, it wasn't really much of a decision to make. They could either shut down the, uh, the light rail and the bus system in San Francisco over you know, a holiday weekend, which is clearly not an option, or they can give away free rides. So what was the option? Really, their only option was to say, we're out of service. Uh, we're going to give away free rides for two days, Black Friday and then the subsequent Saturday. All right, free rides across the board. So let's start thinking about... Uh, how much that cost them. They're saying, that's great. We'll be up and running on Sunday. We don't have to pay this ransom. Our system's only down two days, Friday and Saturday after Thanksgiving. So I went on their website and found that they claim that they provide about 735,000 rides a day. That's on average. I would assume that the rides are actually going to be uh, more, uh, you know, there'll be an uptick over the holiday weekend, especially Black Friday. But even if we're just using their numbers from their website, uh, it's a dollar to ride the bus, 225 to ride the light rail. You start doing the math. They had a backup solution in place. They thought they were good. How much revenue did they lose? Anywhere between one and a half and three and a half million dollars in revenue lost because they didn't have a business continuity solution. They had a backup solution. So they came out of this thinking, this is great. We only were down two days. We didn't pay the ransom. We're back up and running by Saturday. The techs are all patting themselves on the back. Meanwhile, they've lost several million dollars in revenue because they were down, and they had to keep they had to keep their business up and running. Now, you could scale that to whatever kind of business you're in, but there is a cost to being down, and that's what these these criminals are relying upon. All right. Now, again, it's it's so widespread that you you could see it wherever we go. We just opened our most recent office in Singapore, and the first question we got after we went out and did a presentation to some of the managed service providers out there is, well, how does this solution? Uh, fit into the ransomware epidemic because it's huge out here in Southeast Asia. I hear it when I go to Canada. I hear it when I go anywhere around America. Like I said, I was in Kansas. It's big in Kansas. It's big in California, New York, uh, Connecticut here. It's really something that every day you run a Google search for ransomware and there's another story and another story and another story. Um, so the difference between that traditional backup and, and business continuity is pretty simple. What we're trying to do is get you back up and running. We want a solution that's going to keep you going and not just backing up your data. So one of the things that we've introduced um, very recently, this is in Q4, as that epidemic keeps rising, is ransomware detection. Okay. So really how this works is the beauty is kind of in its simplicity. We're not looking for any specific variant of ransomware. We're looking for the footprint that it leaves. Now, the way that we're backing up your data is a little bit different. We're not backing it up at the file level. 
we're actually taking an image of your entire server or workstation that we're backing up and capturing everything, the operating systems, the applications, everything that lives on that device. And from there on, we're just taking block level incremental changes. Now, all of these incremental backups are independent of one another. It's called inverse chain technology, and it's proprietary to Datto. But we don't layer it upon previous backups. So it already fits into the ransomware piece, because if you get hit with ransomware, it's as easy as rolling back to your last backup. Uh, you're setting your schedules to how often that is. Most people are backing it up hourly. So now you're just rolling it back to your last clean backup. Say you get hit right now, you roll it back to 11 o'clock, and you're good to go. But beyond that, because we're backing it up at that block, looking at the block level changes, it allows us to analyze these changes. And we're going to see, okay, these guys have been backing up hourly for the last two months, and everything looks pretty similar. And then all of a sudden, boom, something happens. All the files encrypt, and it looks so much different than all the other backups that we've taken. It leaves that footprint. We can't be sure that it's ransomware, but it sure looks a lot like ransomware. So we're going to notify Monster Technology and say, hey, this backup looks really suspicious, has all the signs of ransomware. You want to look into this. So we're going to notify you immediately of that. And then beyond that, we're going to identify that latest clear version of your file or that backup to say, hey, this is where you could restore from and get you back up and running away right away. I mean, the biggest risk you have is that this, this ransomware is running in the background of your, of your server or your, your workstation has been attacked, and you don't know about it. And now it's been a, you know, two weeks and it's been infecting future backups during that whole time. So that's what this is trying to accomplish. All right? So we take backup one step further. I keep mentioning business continuity and kind of how it differs. We have what's called instant virtualization. I mentioned how we back up our data, right? We're capturing everything. If this computer on the screen right now represents your server or your critical workstation and it goes down or it gets hit with ransomware like this shows, because everything that lived on that device lives on that on-premise data device, we're able to virtualize right from that device. So essentially this data device operates as your server while you're going back and repairing or replacing that server that was infected, okay? It's really business as usual, and we can get up and running in a matter of minutes. That's the difference between having a backup solution like the San Francisco Metro, Metro Transit Authority had and having a business continuity solution. They would not have lost those two days of data if they had a business continuity solution. Now, what's also unique and good about data is we're actually taking active backups in that virtualized state. Okay, so we're not just giving you access to your files. We're really giving you access to a, file, a complete functioning server that's backing up your data. So when that server that was infected is replaced, you could do a bare metal restore and get all of those changes back up and running. So obviously, you know, the benefits are, are, are obvious, right? The first one would be reducing that downtime. Criminals are relying upon you doing that math and saying, if I'm down for two days, it's going to cost me X. In the case of San Francisco, it cost them around two and a half to three and a half million dollars and it's cheaper to pay that ransom. Well, we're going to eliminate that by being able to virtualize you instantly. Now, there's two, I'm going to very briefly talk about these two acronyms, RTO and RPO. Recovery time objective it means how long uh, would, you, are, would you be down? And it's a question you should be able to answer. With whatever backup solution you have, if our systems were to go down, how long would it take us to get back up and running? San Francisco found out for them it was two days. You should be able to tell exactly what your system has and what the capabilities of restoration are. The tricky part is putting a dollar value on that. How much would that cost if we're down for a day or five hours or six hours, whatever that is. RPO is a little simpler. RPO is just how much data are you willing to lose? Are you backing things up weekly? Well, then obviously you run the risk of, of losing a week's worth of backup. The one tricky part about RPO is if you're not testing your backups, really how could you pinpoint that? If you think you're backing up weekly but you're not testing it, you really could be down for You really could run the risk of losing months' worth of data because those backups that you're taking you've never tested. And another good thing about the data device is you could do it locally or from our, our data centers. We've got two bi-coastal data centers. We've got one in Reading, Pennsylvania, one out in Salt Lake City, Utah. So that data device is compromised. If one of those 7% disasters I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar does occur and you have a fire and that data device is compromised, you could utilize the resources in our cloud. And the reason we have them on opposite sides of the country is wherever you're located, you're going to have a safe copy of your data, and that's a really key part of business continuity. So you have the ability to do this whole virtualization process, both locally from the device or utilizing the resources in our cloud. So again, it's about rethinking backup and starting to think about business continuity, um, and that's really the, the, what the criminals want you to think about, and with a solution like data, you could really eliminate that threat. So with that, we're going to open it up to questions. Uh, Colin, I'm going to jump back in here. All right, excellent. Thank you, Michael. Uh, you can go ahead and use the comment box if you have any questions for Michael that, or uh, for myself with Monster Technology that we can answer for you. Um, we have a few minutes, so go ahead and fire away. 
All right. Well, some of those are coming in, Colin. I just want to ask you, I mean, what have you seen personally with your client base? Have you seen an, an uptick in the ransomware attacks? Have you ever had to deal with any of that? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, we had a client about um, a little less than a month ago um, that lost all their data and didn't have anything in place, and it crippled their business. And uh, this is a very popular topic um, and a big concern um, for obvious reasons. Um, and you know something that we're going to do for the attendees today that showed up, um, you know, if if they you know saw uh, what they saw today, it, it interests them in, in booking a demo with uh, one of the sales engineers to walk them through the solution and how that would work for their business. Um, if they decided to sign up for the service, uh, we're going to give them their first month service at no charge, and we're going to do that for the whole month of April. Anybody who signs up. And um, in the month of April, we'll get their first months of service for free. Wow, that's great. Yeah, and I would highly encourage at least getting to that next phase of getting into a demo. I mean, this webinar was more of an educational piece about what's out there, uh, but to do a, a little bit deeper dive into it. And all these devices are custom built, so they're going to be built around your specific environment. Um, so we can get into those kind of details as well on a, kind of an individual basis. Uh, I do see an, uh, a question coming in. This has to do with uh, testing your backups. I, since you mentioned testing your backups, does this happen with a data device? And I could just answer that quickly. The, actually, the answer is yes. We've got what's called screenshot verification. So we're automatically testing those backups to make sure that they occurred. And, and you're not just uh, going to get a little you know, email notification that says, hey, your backup occurred. You're going to get a screenshot of that device booted up, sent to a little, get sent to Colin and his team so they could review that. Um, it's not just testing the backup occurred, it's actually spinning up that virtual machine that we talked about for the virtualization process in the background. So you know that the backup occurred and that it could be virtualized. So you're ready to be virtualized and you have that kind of scheduled set up. Usually it's the last backup of every day. Um, but yeah, we're constantly monitoring that. And so if you do get an alert that says, hey, this backup failed, now Colin and his team go in and take a look at what's going on in a non-disaster situation instead of waiting to find out, hey, we got hit with ransomware and you know there's been a problem with our backups. Um, so that's a good question. I don't know, Colin, you have anything else? Uh, looks like we have one more question coming in. It says, what is the cost of this? Obviously, that's probably, you know, a common question that a lot of people might be thinking. So great question there. Um, you know, the cost is really dependent on the environment. So it's it's not really a question that we can answer. Uh, but if you are interested in the cost, you know, the next step would be to reach out to us uh, directly here at Monster Technology. We can uh, book a you know formal demo with a sales engineer and then get a better idea to size up uh, your environment and decide you know what type of device it would be needed for your environment. And from there we can you know go into costing, obviously. Great. All right, last couple of minutes. Any additional questions that anybody wants to put into the comment box? We can answer those before we wrap it up. Uh, and I do see one more coming in. Uh, I guess it's about retention. What are the retention options? Um, and I could probably handle that. I mean, uh, you know, you're going to have retention both on the local device, which you'd be setting up that schedule, but more importantly in our data centers. And there are a lot of different options. You could choose to have one-year cloud retention or infinite cloud retention. Again, that would be a conversation you'd want to have with Colin and his team to figure out exactly what you want. But there are uh, really an option for everybody's needs, whether, you know, if you're a medical client and you need to have, you know, have a compliance issues, we can keep the data in the data center uh, indefinitely. So that's uh, a great question. All right, excellent. We're going to go ahead and close it there. Thanks, uh, Michael, uh, for putting Thank this you. together for us. And uh, everybody that attended today will be announcing the winner of the Amazon gift card as well as sending a copy of the recording out to everybody. Thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to following up with you regarding backing up your data.